Live from Maryland Public Television, this is Direct Connection with Jeff Salkin. Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in for Direct Connection. Later in the program tonight, Enoch Pratt Library CEO Carla Hayden will join us. But first tonight, new research finds that a Mediterranean diet can prevent 30 percent of deaths from heart disease. Joining us tonight for our Your Health segment is Dr. Anuj Gupta, Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and cardiologist at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Doctor, thank you for being with us. Thank you for inviting me. This Mediterranean diet story has been flying around the internet today. A lot of people interested in it. Is it a fad or is there some research behind it? There's actually a tremendous amount of research behind this diet. Um, the first observation was made when we noticed that patients uh, or people who lived in, in Mediterranean countries like Italy, et, et cetera, um, had much lower rates of heart attack and death than um, people who lived in, uh, for example, the United States. And one of the obvious things that stuck out was perhaps that it was the diet that drove those uh, lower rates of heart attack, stroke, and death. And there's been a tremendous uh, number of observational studies suggesting the same, that the diet was the cause for lower rates. This is the first time a randomized controlled clinical trial has been performed, the, the highest standard of evidence in, in the scientific community, or at least in the medicine community, to demonstrate that perhaps the Mediterranean diet actually reduces that combined risk of heart attack, stroke, and death in high-risk patients. And what are we looking at here? I mean, this is um, more fish, some olive oil. What's the key to it, do you think? Uh, if I knew that, I, I, I wouldn't <laughs> be sitting here. It, yeah, right? <laughs> I, I'd be bottling it and selling it. Um, the Mediterranean diet, as defined in this study, was a diet high in fruits, vegetables, legumes. They were encouraged in, in the patients who were randomized to um, the Mediterranean diet. They were encouraged to have a serving of fish every day. For those who drank, they were uh, recommended to have a glass of wine with meals each day. It appears that that combination, along with, in one group, they got supplemented with olive oil, and in the other group, they got supplemented with various nuts, that somehow this combination of food worked much better in terms of reducing risk than the standard Western diet, that the third group, although they were randomized to a low-fat diet, essentially they were in a regular Western diet. Let me remind our viewers, if you have a question about the Mediterranean diet or preventing heart disease, in general, you can call us. We'll have the number up on the screen. You can also tweet. Send your tweet to at MPT News, and we'll take a look at that. What's your experience in, in practice? When studies like this come out a lot, that you know we get too much salt or, or whatever it is, do, do people change their behavior at all? Do they, if they do, do they do it for more than two days? Yeah. So. The best driver to get patients to change their habits is when something terrible happens to them, like when they have a heart attack. The, it is the wake-up call. That's right. right. It's the best time to encourage someone to quit on the table when we're, I'm trying to fix their heart artery and they're having a heart attack. And you say, look, I'm about to fix your artery, but today's the last day you're ever going to smoke, right? That's a tremendously powerful incentive. However, if you're going to see your doctor on a regular basis and you otherwise feel healthy, it's very difficult to say, gosh, you should eliminate the salt in your diet or you should exercise regularly or you should cut back on fat. Those behavioral changes are extremely difficult. And I, as a physician, can't make someone change their habits. I can only encourage them and say, look, these are the things that would be beneficial in the long run. You, you have a list of frequent questions that you get from patients, and a lot of it has to do with behavioral stuff. So we'll, we'll run through that. Let's take a phone call first. This is Rom in Anne Arundel County. Thank you for calling. There you are. Let's try it one more time. Rom, you're on. Go ahead. I am, I'm here. Thanks for your time, doctor. I have a situation. Recently, I was diagnosed for the cholesterol condition, and my physician prescribed the satin based medication and it showed up all the side effects mentioned under contact doctor immediately. And I learned recently antioxidant, folic acid, niacin, and ubiquinol-based alternate regimen for treating the cholesterol condition. But evidence-based medica practitioners are not receptive to alternate medication. My first question is, are you teaching your student to embrace into the alternate medication regimen? And how do I find such physician? <laughs> Thank you for the phone call. So 
in my list of frequently asked questions, I mentioned this. This is a very common question. The first thing I would say is that it depends on what we're treating. So for example, in the scenario that I gave you of a patient who's having a heart attack, there we know that cholesterol-lowering medications that are commercially available and in, un, under the broad rubric of statins have a dramatic reduction in the risk of heart attack, stroke, or death. Those patients who've had heart attacks or who have um, known proven blockages, patients, those patients should absolutely be on cholesterol-lowering medications unless there's a specific contraindication. The difficult part comes into patients who have no evidence of blockages or have not had complications from blockages anywhere in their body. So there, that's where you're trying to prevent something from happening. And it's not clear um, that an average person walking uh, off the street coming to see their doctor who has no risk factors, who may be in their 40s or 50s but has a high cholesterol, will benefit from these statin medications at least not in a large enough number to make it worthwhile for everyone to take these cholesterol-lowering medications. There are, all, are alternatives. Uh, there are a tremendous number of alternatives. They've been studied in many different ways. Uh, none of them have shown the profound benefit that statins have. Let's uh, talk to Priscilla in Harford County. Priscilla, thanks for the call. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, my question revolves around the vegan diet. It's been brought to my attention that is that is by far a better way to prevent heart disease. And um, I have a book, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, by Caldwell B. Esselstein, Jr., M.D., who puts forth... Um, Priscilla, can I ask a question? Are, are, are you on this? No, I am not, but I'm wondering what the doctor has to say about it. Okay, th thanks for the phone call. It's your life change for me. I, I understand. So, um, Dr. Esselstein from the Cleveland Clinic, or formerly from the Cleveland Cl Clinic, uh, published a book which uh, President Clinton follows, um, where there, he advocates essentially a plant-based diet, no added oils or fats, um, uh, uh, no meats, um, this is not the most, uh, the easiest diet to follow. A as I mentioned, behavioral ch encouraging behavioral changes in patients is extraordinarily difficult. Asking them to make this grand leap forward to a completely vegan diet um, uh, is challenging to say the least. But, uh, but in Bill Clinton, you had that, that uh, operating room experience where he had some serious heart condition. I forget the details. He, he had bypass surgery and then subsequently uh, intracoronary stents placed. I would say moderation is key. The less uh, we eat of fatty foods, the better. I mean, th it's, it's too oh, difficult oh, to oh, encourage oh. people to go to vegan diets. What do you do, knowing all this? <laughs> I'm a lifelong vegetarian. Okay. I've never eaten meat in my life, but that's how I was raised. And I see no incentive to eat meat at this point. Sure. Let's talk to Steve in Washington County. Steve, thanks for the call. Go ahead. Hello, Steve, you're on. Steve, going once, twice. Yeah. Oh. Uh, thanks for taking my call. You're still there. Good. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I remember seeing on 60 Minutes probably 10 or 12 years ago where they said that, uh, hello? You're on. They said that uh, France did a study of the autopsies of World War II uh, soldiers that were killed, 18, 20-year-olds, and they were already showing signs of hardening of the arteries. And it's basically because they are drinking milk. Most societies stop drinking milk when their mothers stop giving them milk. Hmm. But in the United States, people keep drinking milk because we're told it's good for us. Apparently, this is not true, but the, our government supporting the dairy industry does not want to tell us that. Interesting. Steve, thanks very much for yeah. the phone call. How do you feel? Is the fat content something else? Um, so, in fact, if you do autopsies of... Um, uh, fetuses that die in utero, you can find early evidence of atherosclerosis. It's not just 20-year-old soldiers who die on the battlefield. This is a well-recognized dogma of cardiology that atherosclerosis starts, or the process of atherosclerosis starts at a phenomenally young age. Um, how to mitigate or reduce that progression is part of the holy grail of cardiology. And I, I would love to be able to offer a simple solution like eliminate milk um, eliminate meats, uh, that's not 
so easy to do because the data isn't there. Uh, Anne in Dorchester County. Uh, Anne, thank you for calling. Go ahead. Uh, hello. Um, Hi. I like the sound of this diet, but I am concerned about the eating eating fish aspect of it. Uh, there's so much mercury contamination of seafood nowadays, and also with the um, Fukushima um, explosion in Japan, I'm afraid to eat Pacific seafood. So, uh, you know, I'm wondering if we're trading one evil for another. That's a great question, and thank you so much. You're welcome. Every, everything in moderation, you said before. Yeah, everything in moderation, and now I'm way beyond my knowledge base. <laughs> um, well, let's get back to your knowledge base. Number one on your list of, of questions you get from people involves smoking, and I imagine it's it's uh, similar to a situation where somebody needs to have a, a scare, but, but everybody knows smoking is bad. A lot of people smoke. It's very expensive. What do they ask you about it? Um, in fact, the majority of patients who come to see me want to quit smoking. But it's difficult. It's hard to quit smoking. Uh, there's a famous quote that's attributed to Mark Twain, quitting smoking is easy. I've done it a thousand times. Right, right. Right? Patients come to see, to, to see me having tried quitting smoking many different times in many different ways. And they just don't know how. And in fact, a lot of what I do is spend time discussing different st strategies. Um, what is it that drives them to smoke? Most often it's that morning cigarette that they absolutely need when their nicotine level is their absolute lowest. And if we can somehow break that cycle of that first cigarette, perhaps we can get them through the day without smoking. So there are various resources that are available. There's 1-800-QUIT-NOW that's paid through uh, cigarette taxes and www.smokingstopshere.com. I spend a lot of time discussing those resources to patients. Um, I will try patches, drugs, if they want to try hypnosis, I'm willing to find hypnotists for them. What, what have you seen work? Um, uh, any of that? Every, all of these have worked in different patients, which is why I bring, bring them up. Nothing is perfect in every single one of my patients. And what I tell patients is, listen, you've been smoking for years. You have to, if you're interested in quitting smoking, we have to try multiple different strategies. Uh, let's talk about blood pressure for a minute. One of, one of your questions was, my doctor says I should be on blood pressure medication, but I feel okay without it. Is it really necessary? Yeah, so most patients whose blood pressure is elevated feel fine. There's, they feel absolutely nothing. Do they call it the silent killer? The silent it? killer. Yeah. And so if you, you have no symptoms, and yet I, as your doctor, am asking you to take a pill every day or multiple pills every day. Which makes you think that you're sick if you're taking medica medicine you're, every you're day. You're sick and the medications aren't side effect free, they have side effects. So now I'm asking you to take medications when you don't feel bad, which may have side effects that make you feel bad, to prevent something that may happen five or 10 years from now. This is a hard sell. And for many patients, they accept, look, blood pressure is a, one of the leading causes of heart attack, stroke, or death. If we can mitigate that risk by lowering blood pressure, excellent. But there are a, a number of patients who for whatever reason are intolerant of all the different medications that we try. And there are 70 plus different medications on the market. Sometimes you have to go through a variety of different medications until you find the right combination and right doses to control blood pressure. Well, and that brings me to a fascinating study that, that you were working on, you're uh, actively recruiting participants for, uh, to find a way uh, to lower blood pressure in people for whom none of these medicines are, are working. How, do, how does this work? So there is a research trial that I'm the uh, PI for called Simplicity Hypertension 3. Private uh, inve principal investigator. Principal, yeah. principal <laughs> investigator. Um, we, um, we are taking patients who are on multiple different medications for blood pressure and still have uncontrolled blood pressure. And as long as they meet the appropriate screening criteria, we are randomizing them to uh, an interventional therapy that I'll describe in a moment, or placebo. And the interventional therapy is essentially taking a catheter, putting inside the arteries of the kidneys, and burning away the nerves that go into the kidneys. And at least in preliminary studies, there have been dramatic reductions in blood pressure in those pa patients who get treated with this novel therapy. And if it pans out in this phase three trial, um, I'm sure the company will want to take this evidence to the FDA as an alternate treatment for patients who have difficult to control blood pressure. So the, the kidneys, you presume, have something to do with regulating blood pressure? 
Yes, and that's been well recognized for uh, over a century, uh, and specifically the hormonal um, uh, regulatory mechanisms that interplay between the kidney and the brain are also well recognized. This is a way of interrupting some of those hormonal communications between the brain and the kidney and the rest of the body. If uh, somebody out there is a good candidate for this, thinks they may be, how do they get in touch? Uh, if they call the University of Maryland uh, number, which can be posted up here, um, that's actually a, a great way you, that you can look up in clinicaltrials.gov, the Simplicity Hypertension 3 trial, or if you live in the state of Maryland, uh, uh, we're the site in the, in, in the state of Maryland for this trial. Very good. Dr. Gupta, appreciate the time. Thank you very much for inviting me. Your health segments are a co-production of Maryland Public Television and the University of Maryland Medical System.